First of all, I'd like to say how happy I, I am to be back among you all. For those of you who are new to UCE, I was the ministerial intern here from 2015 to 2017. Since my departure, I have since graduated from Meadville Lombard Theological School in Chicago, and I'm in preparation to visit our credentialing organization, organization the Ministerial Fellowship Committee in Boston, in September, where if I pass, knock on wood, uh, I'll become a fellowship minister in the Unitarian Universalist Association, and may God have mercy on my soul. <laughs> now, one of the main reasons I felt called to seminary was to fight oppression and bigotry in whatever forms they take, and unfortunately, there does seem to be a lot of forms recently. From what's happening to our southern, at our southern border, to professional athletes being denied their First Amendment rights, to the way governmental budgets are now being written, the hallmarks of white supremacy are everywhere. In Star Wars lore, the Force is described as something that surrounds us and penetrates us. It penetrates all that we do. Unlike the Force, there is no good side to white supremacy. Everyone suffers. From the people of color who are denied basic rights to the white person who mistakenly believes that the lie, believes the lie, that since their skin tone is lighter, they are therefore better. We are all suffering from white supremacy. We all know that supremacy is one, or that, that this supremacy is one of the main problems that haunt our country and society. But then it begs the question, what can we as white allies do to stop it? What can we do when confronted with injustice and intolerance? This was the question I faced almost a year ago when my wife and I attended the Elkhart County NAACP dinner. Now, we've lived in Indiana for almost 10 years now, and for most of those years, we have attended this dinner. For one thing, going gives Amy and I a chance to dress up and eat a fancy dinner and mingle with the powers that be in Elkhart, such as they are. We also attend because we believe in the mission of the NAACP, and it's a way for my wife's UU Church too, as we say, when we pick up the collection every Sunday, to support an organization with values similar to our own. Elkhart has drawn some distinguished guests since we've been attending, the best known being Ben Jealous, who at the time when he came to Elkhart was the leader of the national NAACP organization and is now the Democratic nominee for the state of Maryland. The guest preacher for last year for that particular night was Curtis Hill, a local person who had done good. He is currently the Attorney General for the state of Indiana who grew up in Elkhart and served as county prosecutor for a little over a decade. And the one thing to know about Indiana is that to get elected to anything, you have to be a Republican, especially in Elkhart County. We are the reddest county in a red state. He is also a person of color, so the fact that he was the keynote speaker made sense. My wife and I had a feeling that he would probably be espousing beliefs that were not like ours. We had no idea. Over the course of his remarks, Curtis Hill talked about how oppression wasn't real, and it wasn't that the criminal justice system was rigged against people of color. It was because African American boys grew up without fathers who didn't have the personal responsibility to stay out of jail, and that black on black violence is the real problem, not police brutality. Mind you, he was saying this to a room full of people of color mostly African-Americans. The more he spoke, the angrier I got, and I could tell that his words were having an effect on the people who were sitting around the table where we were. The more Hill spoke, the more I had the feeling that I had to do something. And since the election of Trump as president, I think many of us has had this feeling to do something. He and his administration are so hateful towards people of color and really just about everybody at this point, and it's only getting worse. And for most of my life, I've watched the grainy black and white footage of those who participated in civil rights marches, the people who fought for unionization of workplaces, the anti-Vietnam protests, and so on. I felt called to be a part of and participate in protests and marches for a whole host of issues. And I've asked myself, and probably those of us who weren't alive during those decades, what would I have done if I had been alive back then? 
And so here I was, sitting in a formal dinner that supports an organization that ended legal segregation, listening to a speaker who espouses the opposite of what the NAACP stands for. I didn't know what to do, so I did nothing. I preached about this during one of my last classes at Meadville, and the class I was in was led by Mark Morrison Reed, who has written volumes on the forgotten people of color that tried to make an impact on our religion. And his books such as Darkening the Doorways, Black Pioneers in a White, in a White Religion, and one of my favorites of his, The Selma Awakening. If you all haven't read his work, please do. It's amazing. He is a man I greatly admire. During the feedback after I was done preaching, I took what I had done or didn't do that night and talked about it with that class. And after I was done preaching, one of the students who was a white woman who was married to an African-American man said to me that I needed to know my place in that situation. And for a long time, I thought about what does that mean? Where is my place? That night in October, I considered how things would look if I had done something. The look of a tall, loud, heterosexual white guy walking out, thereby silently telling a room full of African Americans that another black person is wrong, aren't good opt optics, and not productive. And at the same time, I recalled the word of Desmond Tutu, who once said, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. If an elephant has his foot on the tail of a mouse, and you say you are neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. So the question kept haunting me. Where is my place in a situation like that? I finally figured out that my urge to do something is rooted in white supremacy and patriarchy. I have been culturally educated that as a tall, loud, white, heterosexual white guy, when something is happening that I don't agree with, that it's got to be me or someone who looks like me to do something, regardless of the consequences. Savior complex, paternalism, perfectionism. These are all hallmarks of white supremacy. Anything less would be considered cowardice. If I am perceived either by, the, by other people or myself as a coward, then I am a less of a man because of it. It means I didn't stand up for my beliefs or stand up for those around me, regardless if they asked for it or not. And therefore, I would be complicit in contributing to oppression. It's a pretty nasty cycle, isn't it? If I had done something that evening, I believe I would have made a complete fool of myself. So the question remains, what is a white ally to do? The first answer is, don't make it all about me, or you, or anybody. Social justice only works when a large, diverse group of people work for it. Dismantling white supremacy is having a million tiny interactions daily. If it's one person reading, leading a crusade, it will be doomed to fail. Which leads to my second answer. For a social justice movement to be successful, it needs to be led by those who are suffering from oppression. I grew up in a rural, mostly white state in a blue-collar family. I've lived a middle-class lifestyle my whole life. I have had access to health care, jobs, education, housing, you name it, and no one has ever questioned my motives or my reasons. I've just done as I wanted or needed to do. I am not a person of color, a woman, or on the queer spectrum, or any of the other Things. So for me to say I know what's good for anyone in those groups of people, I would be perpetuating a system of all the things I abhor. Bigotry, discrimination, misogyny, homophobia, and so on. As a white liberal, unless I am called to take on a leadership position, it is best for me to follow the lead of those who are oppressed and use my white privilege to move social justice forward for everyone, not just so I feel bold or righteous. So at the end of that evening last October, I was told by a woman of color that what I needed to do was to let the other people around the table know that I had their backs in whatever they wanted to protest what was being said. And that brings me to a lesson I learned in the class I mentioned earlier. 
Mark Morrison Reed stated that the only way to create social justice is by the relationship that one builds, not by being a mouthpiece or having one's face on television. Anything, anything else is an ego stroke. This is the reason why when the Reverend Dr. William Barber, who led the Moral Mondays campaign and is now reviving the Poor People's Campaign, whenever he is on stage, regardless if he's preaching, if he's leading a rally, or if he's talking to a small group, he always has a diverse group, group of people around him, so that way he never appear, appears to be leading the charge all by himself. And whatever he does, he has people behind him. He literally never appears alone. I was in relationship with most of the people at that table I sat around that night, but I was so caught up in my own emotion, I didn't have the insight to ask those around me, what should we do? And in the end, it's about the we, not the I. If I ever find myself in that kind of position again, I will ask those around me if there is something that can be done or not done. So I want to conclude my thoughts by saying this. The thoughts and feelings espoused by the likes of Curtis Hill, Donald Trump, and, and the other white supremacists that you can think of are not the problem. They are merely a symptom of a larger disease that has infected this country from the first day a white European set foot on the shores of this continent. The disease is the idea that just because, because one person's skin tone is lighter than another, therefore makes one a better person. In an op-ed written by Agunda Okeo on the website vice.com from last September 22nd, the title of the article was, If We Want White Supremacy to End, White America Needs to Step It Up. She quoted Dr. Martin Luther King by saying, and these were King's words, somebody told a lie one day, he said as the congregation rustled out of the frame. They crouched it in language. They made everything black, ugly, and evil. Look in your dictionary and see the synonyms of the word black. It is always something degrading and low and sinister. And look at the word white. It is always something pure, high, and clean. So what is a white ally to do? What is our place? Our place is to stop perpetuating this lie, to use our privilege when needed to raise up those who are oppressed and discriminated against. It is our place to lead when asked, and to follow the rest of the time. It is our place to put our bodies and minds on the line to stop tragedies like Charlottesville, Ferguson, Watts, Tulsa, Los Angeles, and too many others to name. It's our place to work to get people elected to office with open minds and open hearts that will work for the people, not just the moneyed corporate interests. That's the hard learned lesson I learned that night in October and the lesson I wish to impart to you all today. Amen and blessed be.